Hey, I'm Tad, the associate pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this recorded service online. If you would like more information about our service times where you could come join us in person, you can see those at wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us at info at wilkesborobaptist.org. We hope that you enjoy it. God bless. Amen. Beautiful way to start the service. Let's sing a hymn of praise to our great Lord and Savior. One, two. Great are you, Lord. You give life. Let's sing together. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken.
That is a wonderful hymn and a reminder, and we're going to deal with that very truth here in just a little bit in our text, the fact that Jesus does indeed live. I'm going to ask if you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 17. A number of years ago, as we were working our way through the book of Acts, I preached this passage of Scripture. I'll do so again uh, for several reasons. One, there are I love all of the Bible, and I hope you do as well, but there are some passages of Scripture that just have a special place in my own heart and life. And as a pastor and someone who shares the gospel with people, someone who has taught and does teach in terms of a a, a Bible college and in seminary settings and that sort of thing, one of the things I've always looked for are places in Scripture that remind us that God has the answers that humans are looking for. In fact, as we look around our world today, there seem to be a lot of people searching for a lot of things. And the answer to what they're looking for is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But so many people around us don't know it because they don't know how their questions and their lack and their need connect to what the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches and says. And Acts chapter 17 provides us an illustration of exactly that very truth taking place some 2,000 years ago when Paul made his way to Athens, Greece. Many of you in your courses of study in your high school and college degree had to read Plato. Or maybe you were familiar with Aristotle. Or maybe you've heard about Socrates. Or maybe even a philosopher prior to that, Thales. But the rest of us, while we may remember that we've heard the name of some of those philosophers, and by the way, still in philosophy courses and politics courses today, you have to read Plato and you have to read Aristotle and you have to interact with their thoughts. And and they wrote and lived some 23 or 2400 years ago. But for most of what was going on in Athens prior to that, it was kind of religious weirdness would be a good way to say it. Some of you have heard the names of Greek deities like Zeus or Aphrodite or or Apollos, but we don't have to study those in textbooks. Unless you're in a mythology class, you're not going to pay much attention to the Greek deities of some 25 or 2600 years ago. The reason for that is according to Western history and the transition of Western history, the philosophy of Greece is something worth our study. In fact, it was uh, important in developing our own culture and our own values in America. The way we operate, the way we think about things politically, in some ways were shaped by some of the thinkers of Greek philosophy. Greek religion had little to no impact on us, or at least on our ideology. But that wasn't true some 2,000 years ago in Greece. In fact, in Greece, there were significant divisions and arguments and dissensions going on between those who were proponents of the original kind of Greek religious system and those who came along with Greek philosophy. You want to know a little bit more about Greek religious system in an accessible way, read Homer's Iliad or Homer's Odyssey. And Homer kind of displays what the gods were like, what the deities were like. They were a little bit crazy. They were nothing more really than glorified human beings. They had all of the weaknesses and the trappings and the difficulties of humanity just with a little bit more power. And what happened in Greece some 2,500 years ago or so is that some thinkers came along, like Thales and then ultimately Plato and Aristotle and others, and they said, hold on a second. This can't be all there is to the world. There can be Zeus because we don't see him at work in the world. And, and how does all this, all this stuff function? And so they started arguing and debating. Here's what they were debating. Greek religion offered a transcendent connection to some kind of deity. Now, you had to get there in weird ways. Sometimes you had to travel to a place called the Oracle of Delphi, and there were these vapors that came up out of the rock, and these people would breathe in the vapors and offer unintelligible utterings that some kind of priest or prophet would interpret. Doesn't sound like much fun to any of us that we're going to go do that, but that was the Greek religious system. Philosophers came along and said, this is nuts, just like we do. We read that and we're like, hold on a second, I'm very uncomfortable with that. Philosophers said the same thing. They wanted a rational explanation for the way that things were in the world. And so they offered ideas, like like ultimate reality came from ideas, Plato's concept. 
or ultimate reality came from some type of element in, in creation, water or fire or a number of other kind of ideas. That's what the philosopher said. And this debate went on in Greece for some about 500 years from the classical period of Greece the, the, the philosophers debated the religious folks, and the religious folks debated the philosophers. Remember, the Grecian people, here's what they wanted, a transcendent connection to some ultimate reality. They wanted a relationship with God. They couldn't find it in their religious system. Philosophers came along and said, hold on a second, we want to present a rational explanation for the world because what you're doing doesn't make sense. The problem was... The philosophers couldn't get at the transcendent connection, and the religious folks couldn't get at a rational explanation. And that's where Paul entered the scene. Read with me, if you will. Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him, for he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. Some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching uh, of Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. A couple of things about that paragraph that opens up our text, and we'll read the rest of it in a moment. One, Paul's spirit was provoked within him, angered literally, because he walked in Athens and he saw that the city was full of idolatry. Practically speaking, in the, 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 the um, dissension between Greek philosophy and Greek religion, Greek religion won out, at least in Athens. They were still a city full of idolatry. They didn't su supplant their idolatry with philosophy. There were still debates and arguments going on all over the place, and Paul was troubled by it. Why? Because idolatry leads to separation from a relationship with God forever and forever. So Paul witnessed that and watched that. He debated there in the, in the marketplace. He debated in the synagogues. He taught about the good news of Jesus Christ to Epicurean philosophers who were hedonists. They were the folks that said, hey, whatever you feel like doing, if it feels good, do it. Sounds very familiar to our contemporary culture today. The Stoic philosophers were on the other side of the equation. They were fatalists. They believed that you just took it on the chin and you just pulled through and you just made your way. So you can imagine why Epicureans and Stoics would de de debate one another. And Paul entered into that scene where all of this religious debate, philosophical debate had happened. And they invited him because of he was preaching and teaching things that they hadn't heard before. They hadn't heard the good news about Jesus before. They hadn't heard the gospel before. They invited him to the Areopagus. That would essentially be like someone inviting a preacher to Congress and giving them the audience of the senators and the representatives and saying, preach the gospel. It would be like a seminary, or, or, or excuse me, a college professor, university professor, inviting a, a preacher of the gospel to step into not just a classroom, but a compilation of classrooms with multiple professors and disciplines standing there and a, a, a spokesperson proclaim the gospel. They gave Paul an audience. They gave him a platform and said, hey, we don't understand what you're saying. Would you come speak to us? You know what Paul preached? He preached the good news of Jesus Christ. J.I. Packer simplifies the gospel this way. He says, the gospel is a message about God and his holiness, a message about man and his sinfulness, a message about Jesus Christ, and a summons to repentance and faith. In other words, it, it says some things that we need to know and we need to ex apply and we need to hear. And that's exactly what Paul did in this message. He had an open audience with the, the debates, 500-year debates, between Greek religion and philosophy, and Paul stepped in to proclaim none other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in this sermon, he applies, or applies the gospel to three needs of the human heart. The first need is this. We need the light of the gospel to expose the idols in our hearts. That's what we need. Notice this sermon that Paul preached. Verse 22. So Paul, 
aware, by the way, of all of that was going on historically, culturally, philosophically, the tensions. Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands, <clears throat> as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, <clears throat> for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the imagination of man. Times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Paul at the Areopagus stood up and complimented them first. Or, it was a backhanded compliment. I perceive that you were very religious because I walked around. I saw idol after idol after idol after idol. And, and you're so religious, he said to the Greek people there in Athens, that you have an idol, an altar to an unknown God. And then Paul went on to say, this unknown God that you don't know who you're talking about, I'm going to proclaim him to you. And what he was talking about was connecting a story that took place in Athens that the philosophers and religious folk would have been familiar with some 600 years or so before Paul stood there and preached. There was a plague that had run rampant through the city of Athens. And, and they sacrificed all the, uh, all the gods that they knew to sacrifice to, and the plague still ran rampant. There was nothing that they could do to stop the particular plague that was running through Athens. They heard about a particular philosopher named Epimenides of Crete. And they heard he was a wise man, and so they sought out Epimenides. They brought him to Athens, and, and they told Epimenides what was going on. We've got this, this plague that's running rampant. We've sacrificed our, our, our idols. What do you think we ought to do? How do we stop this plague that's running through our land? And, and here's what Epimenides remarked. He said, It is obvious that your sacrifices have not worked. The plague remains. You obviously have not appeased the God who can take the plague away. Here's my counsel. Take choice sheep and rams and let them go into a field first thing in the morning. The animals that lie down are the ones that you should sacrifice. And with your sacrifice, plead ignorance to this unknown God, and maybe he will forgive you. The folks there in Athens told him that he was a little bit nuts because rams and sheep don't lay down first thing in the morning because they've been laying down all night. They go eat. They said, nevertheless, it sounds like a plausible idea, so that's exactly what they did. They put out rams and sheep in this particular field, and sure enough, several of the rams and several of the, sh uh, of the sheep, when they went out that morning, instead of eating, they knelt down, they bowed down on the ground where, right where they were, and what did the people of Athens do? They erected altars to unknown, an unknown God right there in that space. And they sacrificed those sheep and those rams on that altar. And when they did that, they pleaded the ignorance of their ways to an unknown God that they had no idea about. And guess what happened? The plague went away. Paul knew that story. And so as Paul knew that story and he stepped into Athens, he said, you have this God that you don't know who he is. An event took place some 600 years ago where you had an interaction with maybe this God. I'm telling you who this God is. And what did he say about this God? He said, this God that you don't know who he is is the God who made everything. See, Greek religion didn't believe that the gods were ultimately in control of all of creation. And Greek philosophers couldn't figure out who it was or what it was that ultimately created everything. That's why for 500 years they debated where did ultimate reality come from? And Paul said, I've got the answer for you. And it's not an answer that I know in and of my own wisdom or righteousness. I've got an answer from the pages of Scripture because I know the God who made everything. 
I know the God who spoke the world into existence. He is the one who created all things, and he is the one who invites us into relationship with himself. In other words, here's what Paul came preaching at Athens. He came preaching a connection to the transcendent God, which is what Greek religious people had longed for for millennia. He came preaching that there's a God who you can know, but that God who you know also explains rationally how the world came about and how all things happen. And you don't have to sit on some kind of stone waiting for vapors to come up to have this kind of insider understanding. You simply enter into a relationship with the living God who spoke the world into creation. He goes on, he said, verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men, nor is he served by human hands. In other words, he goes on to say, verse 29, we ought not think the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Here's what Paul does. He says, the God whom you don't know and that I'm proclaiming to you, what you're worshiping instead are idols. You're worshiping something in the place of the one true God. And what you need to do is worship the one true God in place of all the some things that you have in place. In other words, what Paul did even in a complimentary fashion at the very outset, is he turned the tables on them and he pointed out that their idolatry was their problem. The fact they were worshiping something, someone, some other deity, some other image. For the philosophers, they were worshiping their own brains or their own hearts or their own ideologies. For the religious folks, they were worshiping a whole variety of images and idols. And what did they need? They needed a God who could point out to them that Their idolatry was leading them away from him forever and forever and for eternity. Heartbreaking is what was taking place there in Athens. But we're not altogether that different in our culture today. We worship at the altar of self with selfies and self-promotion and self-help. We worship at the altar of wealth, stuff, money, and things. We worship at the altar of power privilege, authority, and control. We worship at the altar of pleasure, luxury, and sex. We worship at the altar of government, entitlement, control, telling us to think or what we believe. We, we worship at so many different altars in contemporary American culture. It may not be like Athens where there is a god or an idol <clears throat> on a platform inside the Areopagus or near the Areopagus, But it is everywhere. And here's the reality. As long as we're worshiping anything other than the one true God, we have idolatry in our hearts that's going to keep us from knowing God through Jesus Christ. What does the gospel teach? The gospel teaches that we need to worship the one true God. He alone is worthy of our worship. Tim Keller puts it this way. He defines an idol as a counterfeit God. That is anything so central and essential to your life that should you lose it, your life would feel hardly worth living. And don't we know people like that who have lost their health and they've become disillusioned and depressed, who have lost their wealth and they've become disappointed, who have lost their family for whatever reason and their life has just been rocked. And I'm not talking about normal everyday grief. I'm talking about someone who can't make it anymore because the thing that they had put on the platform as their idle as their thing of focus, as their thing of attention, that thing that they focused on is gone. Because it's gone, they're disappointed and disillusioned and heartbroken and devastated and disappointed. Keller says, really, there are only a few things we can do when that happens. We can blame the things that disappoint us. We can blame ourselves and enter into shame. We can blame the world and become cynics. Or what we can do when we realize that those things don't come, uh, don't bring about the hope and the peace that we need is we can turn from those things and turn to God and focus our lives on Him. In short, what we need is the God that Paul preached. See, Paul's preaching and he spends the majority of his sermon talking about God. Not talking about Jesus on the cross, not talking about his ministry. He spends the majority of his time talking about God because these individuals, that's where their hang-up was. They didn't know who the one true God was. Dallas Willard puts it this way. He says, the ultimately lost person is the person who cannot want God. Who cannot want God to be God. Multitudes of such people pass by every day and pass into eternity. The reason they do not find God is that they do not want Him, or at least they do not want Him to be God. Wanting God to be God is very different from wanting God 
to help me. This is the reason we are so locked into self-worship and self-denial that we cannot want God. Notice how Paul described this, verse 27, that they should seek God, perhaps feel their way toward him, yet he's actually not far from each one of us. What does this mean for us as a, 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 in an audience like this today? Do you want a God of your own imagination? Do you want a God that fits on a shelf? That you reach down and, and pull him off when you need him? That's not the God we have. The God we have and worship does not fit in a temple. He does not exist in the space of a church building. He's not present here, especially because we're here uh, in this room in the sense that, that this is where he is confined. This is not his, he, he's not confined by our room. He's not confined by our thoughts or I, I, ideas or our ideologies. He's bigger than all of that. He's the one who's absolutely in control. And we need the gospel to show us the idolatries of our heart so that we can worship the one true God. The second gospel need that's found in, in Paul's sermon here is we need the insights of the gospel to address the ignorance of our minds. Verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands people everywhere to repent. Times of ignorance. Did you notice the quotes there? Paul says, in him we live and move and have our being. We are indeed his offspring. If you look in your copy of Scripture and you see the little notes down at the bottom, they're not quotes from the Old Testament. Paul's not quoting Scripture here. He's quoting Greek thinkers. One of them is probably a poem. Uh, another one is Epimenides of Crete. The very man that came, up, came to Athens 600 years before and told them how they could solve their problems of, of, of this, this plague is probably the first quote that Paul makes. In other words, Paul knew the story, he knew the circumstances, and he's quoting the hero of their story 600 years ago to point out that God is near us and he's available to us if we will come to the God who is. And what's interesting is Epimenides said to the Greek people 600 years previous, Maybe if you sacrifice to this God, maybe, he'll forgive your ignorance. And what language did Paul use here? The times of ignorance, God has overlooked. What is ignorance? It's simply not knowing. Ignorance is not a bad thing. It's a shortfall. It's lack. I'm ignorant when it comes to physics. I don't know much when it comes to physics. I'm ignorant of a lot of things. You're ignorant of a lot of things. But one thing we cannot afford to be ignorant about is our own condition and God who made us and redeemed us. And the gospel it is what gives us uh, the ability to address the ignorance of our own minds. Greek philosophy wanted people not to be ignorant. Their bent was to create rational explanations for the world inside of a religious system or religious culture that didn't have those answers. Today, we experience the same levels of ignorance and shortfall. Uh, we, we experience it with relation to all sort of things going on in our society and our system. Nancy Piercy puts it this way. She said, a modernist view of nature inevitably leads to a postmodern view of morality. Postmodern gender theory grounds your identity not in your own biology, but in your mind. You are what you feel. The self is completely autonomous. The literal meaning of that word, a law unto oneself, it, it carries with it the idea that the autonomous self is outside of any source of moral, moral law and is inherently oppressive. In other words, her point is, is simply this. In today's culture, what we have is we don't have a, a room full of gods where we have these little idols on shelves we have a room full of people, and the people themselves are the idols. The people themselves are the, the place of worship. We see it in pop culture. We see it in ideology. We see it in discovering the God within. We see it in self-help perspectives. And you know what all of that is? Lovingly, I would say to all of you in the room, that is ignorant. That, that is us putting our attention on the wrong one. This ignorance... This type of ignorance is thinking that we know better than the one who knows everything. Thinking that we know better than the one who made everything. And so Paul in this sermon spent time explaining and proclaiming God so that the people that were there in his audience would hear 
and would not be ignorant of what they needed. They needed forgiveness. They needed redemption. They needed perspective. They needed life. Piercy puts it again this way. Christianity affirms that we live in a universe structured not by blind forces, but by the loving purposes of a personal creator. And we are called to live in harmony with that structure. And that is exactly what Paul invited. Paul invited his hearers to say, I'm going to stop being ignorant and I'm going to meet the God who created everything. I'm going to recognize that I'm idolatrous and that I need forgiveness And so Paul preached that way so that they would overcome their idolatries and overcome their ignorance. And here's why he preached exactly that way. Because idolatries and ignorance leave us dead and desperate. The problem with the human condition is that our souls are dead. The third need that Paul preached here in the text, we need the power of the gospel to give life to the deadness of our souls. Where did the audience lose Paul? Where did they say he was preaching strange divinities earlier in the text? Because he was preaching the resurrection. See, for Greek philosophy and Greek religion, there was no such thing as resurrection. It just was not possible. In many of the Greek philosophies, things that were ultimate were things that were in the realm of ideas, not in the realm of the body. In many Greek philosophies, the body was evil and bad and should be ignored altogether. Greek religious system didn't have any, any, any like for the body because the body was just a mechanism, just a means, and, and it was going to die and go away. And so when Paul was standing there saying to them, listen, God's going to judge the world, and he's affirmed that by raising Jesus from the dead, what Paul was saying was something so drastically in contrast with what the Greek religious system and the Greek philo- philosophical system had held. He was telling them that their problem was they were dead in their sins. They were unrighteous in their ignorance. They were idolatrous in their worship. And they needed forgiveness and they needed life because they were spiritually dead. And so what did he preach? He preached the resurrection. Folks, because he lives, we have the opportunity to live. Because he lives, we can be forgiven. Because he lives, we don't have to be ignorant. Because he lives, we don't have to worship idols. We can worship the one true God. And gospel is based on Christ's death and bodily resurrection. And it is absolutely vital that we believe Jesus rose from the dead in order for eternal life to be possible. In this 21st century, our philosophers and thinkers and idolaters address the human condition with idolatry or with idols. We attempt to create gods out of our own autonomous selves or we try to create answers out of rational thought and rational ideas. Not altogether different from what Paul experienced in Athens some 2,000 years ago. And do you know what the human condition results in, whether it's idolatry or ignorance? It results in deadness, spiritual deadness, spiritual brokenness. Folks, that's the condition of every single person. That you and I encounter, that is our condition before we met Jesus Christ. Notice what happened there at the, the end of this sermon. When they, verse 32, when they heard him speak of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we'll hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. Some joined and believed, among whom were Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Let me be frank with you. Several responses we could give to Paul's sermon in Athens. One response is the response of mockery. Folks, there have been times in my life where I've preached the gospel to people, shared the gospel with people, talked with people about Jesus, and I was met with disdain and unbelief and mockery. And folks, that's what happened. Some of those that heard Paul, they said, <laughs> you're crazy. You've lost your mind, man. I don't want to have anything to do with that kind of ideology or that kind of sermon. It's heartbreaking. Folks, there are people out there that is their response to the gospel. Some responded with this. They said, we'll hear you again. Hold on a second. I want to hear more. I'm not entirely sure. I'm convinced. And and let me encourage you, Christian, about this. Some of you are praying for lost people. Some of you have shared the gospel with lost people. Some of you have invited lost people to church. And some of you are a little bit, you're, you're tired because it's taken a long time. Here in Paul's day, So I'm to hear him again. I mean, one of the greatest preachers that's ever preached in all of the world is Paul. And he needed to preach again for some of them to become converts. 
So don't get discouraged if it takes a little while for someone. Keep praying, keep preaching, keep encouraging, keep inviting. Good thing is some believed. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power of God to change a human heart. It's the power of God to raise someone who is dead. Folks, the reality is our efforts at self-righteousness through autonomous idolatry are going to fall short. Our efforts at, at discovering answers in the world and, and, and alleviating our ignorance through education and solving our own problems, that's going to leave us dead. It's going to leave us apart. We don't need something from within, and we don't need a different deity. We need God. We need a relationship with the living creator of the universe. Because our problem is that we're spiritually dead and we need life. I'll close with this. Our family, my wife and I have been married 20 years. We have not had good luck with trees in our, in our, in our lives as a couple. We had some trees fall on a car that we had many, many years ago. When we lived in, in Hendersonville, we had a tree, a white oak tree that just fell one day. Little windstorm tree fell completely over. Six years ago or so here in Wilkesboro, we had a maple tree. All of a sudden, I left the house on a Saturday morning. Fifteen minutes later, my wife called me and said, did you see the tree that fell? And I was like, what tree? The tree that was in our front yard that was standing when I left? And a tree just fell over. A maple tree just fell over. As it turned out, that white oak that fell and that maple that fell, as you looked inside of it, there was a blight inside the tree. On the outside, the tree looked just fine. I mean, an expert probably could have looked at the white oak or the maple and said, ah, there's something wrong with that tree because of some of the things. But I could, I don't, I'm not an expert in that field. I have no idea how to look at a tree and say whether or not a tree's healthy or not. If it's got brown when it's supposed to be green, I can tell you that it's a problem. But other than that, I have no idea. Here's the point. On the outside, the day before those trees fell, they looked okay. They looked alive. They looked well-rooted. But on the inside, they were dead as they could be. It was just a matter of time before they fell over and showed everybody what was true on the inside. Can I tell you, folks, that's exactly the nature of the people that Paul preached to in Athens. It's exactly our human nature before we meet Christ. It's exactly the human nature of all the people around us that don't have a relationship with the living God. Folks, they, they may look okay on the outside. They may look like they're living life okay on the outside, but on the inside, they're dead. Do you know what they need? They need resurrection. They need the one who lives. They need the one who can give them eternal life. So I know as I look out across our audience most, if not everyone in here, has already made a personal relation, a decision to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. But we've got folks coming at our next two services and folks that have been coming in the life of our church and folks that we've been praying for or witnessing to that do not yet know Christ. Here's what I want to ask you to do at the invitation. I want you to pray that they'll meet the one who can give them life. I want you to pray that God will reveal to them their idolatries. I want you to pray that God will show them their ignorance. I want you to pray that God will help them realize they're dead and the only one that can give them life is someone who defeated death, and that's Jesus. That's why the resurrection is so important. That's why Paul ended on the resurrection, because he's the only one that can take something dead and give it life. He did so for you, and he did so for me. He can do so for them. Would you pray that God would rescue them from their sin? Make this time of invitation a time of prayer for the souls of those who are lost. Stand with me, if you will. Our Father, we come to you this day and we thank you for Paul's boldness in preaching a message that his Athenian hearers needed to hear and also we need to read today. Pray, Lord, that you would remind us, convict us if we have idols in our way, and I pray that you would change us, Lord, from our ignorance, and I pray that you would give us life through Christ. And, Lord, desperately we pray for those who will attend our next services who do you not yet know Christ. I pray for their souls. I pray for their lives. I pray for their uh, repentance. I pray for them to come to know Jesus and turn from their sins and turn to Christ. I pray for you to change their hearts. I pray that you give us confidence to share the gospel over and over again. The power of the gospel might change and redeem. I pray, Lord, that this day you be worshiped as we celebrate the Christ who gives us life. In Christ's name, amen. We're glad to have you worship with us online today. 
If you'd like to learn more about following Jesus or you'd like more information about Wilkesboro Baptist Church, visit our website, wilkesborobaptist.org, or you can email us, info at Again, thank you for worshiping with us.